Hello and welcome back to my channel. Welcome back to Halloween week where I'm going to be covering cases on mysteries, disappearances and murders that took place on or around Halloween time. This case is another dark one and my apologies in advance. Most of these cases are dark. Uh, it's not intentional. It's just what's available. When you search the internet, when you are trying to do research and trying to find cases to cover in the true crime spectrum, it's never going to be pretty. So if this isn't the type of content that you enjoy watching, I understand if you want to skip out on this one. However... If you do enjoy true crime, please do your best to be respectful of the victims and the victims' families, as always. The story takes place in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. It was Halloween time, 2012. A single mother named Rebecca Gay was 24 years old at the time this happened. She had a three-year-old son named Conway who she loved more than life itself. She was co-parenting with Conway's dad and she was in a relationship of her own and by all accounts her life was going very well. She was so happy. She had a job. She had a family who loved her. She had this beautiful little boy her life was tragically cut short and she wasn't deserving of what happened to her. No one is when they are murdered, but this one really hurt. So to celebrate Halloween, she had decorated her home with eight scarecrows and she made plans with her boyfriend, Aaron Kuhn, to go trick-or-treating with three-year-old Conway. But on the 31st of October 2012, Rebecca didn't get to work at a local store so her co-worker actually went to Rebecca's home to look for her which obviously is such a sweet gesture. Rebecca wasn't there but her car was in a bar parking lot near her trailer. The landlord unlocked the door to the home and inside Rebecca's purse was on a counter but she was nowhere to be found which was so strange. Her mother, Sally Gay, and her friends grew very concerned because it wasn't typical for Rebecca to skip out on work. It wasn't typical for her you know, to just go missing without anyone knowing where she was. So neither her boyfriend, Aaron, nor her mother, Sally, or her co-workers, her boss, her friends, no one knew where she was. And this was, again, it wasn't a co common occurrence. It wasn't a common occurrence at all, so everyone was very worried and they grew suspicious as time progressed and she just didn't get in touch with anyone. She didn't show up at work, she wasn't at home, where could she have been? Sheriffs then executed a search of her residence and her vehicle. The police observed an area of a carport that looked like it had just recently been cleaned. It was suspicious because the rest of the carpet didn't look like you know it had been deep cleaned like this particular spot this particular spot looked like someone really put a lot of effort into cleaning it so of course it's suspicious you know you could spill wine or you know spill something food and you know clean a particular part but that particular it seemed like it too much like it seemed like a big area and the police said okay this some something's up here and everything else also that in the surrounding areas in the trailer it, it appeared that there had been some type of struggle and this is according to sheriff leo mio du whiskey of the isabella county sheriff's office rebecca's home was then determined to be a crime scene and the entire neighborhood was canvassed not only by detectives, but, but by Rebecca's loved ones as well. Detectives talked with people close to Rebecca, including Aaron, as well as Conway's father, but both men were cleared as suspects. 
detectives also interviewed John White, who was a 55-year-old minister of a small church who was in a relationship with Rebecca's mother, Sally. He was actually engaged to Sally at this time, so he would be Rebecca's stepfather, or soon-to-be stepfather. He lived in the same trailer park as Rebecca, and it was actually routine for him, John White, to drop three-year-old Conway off with his father on Wednesdays. So, for a very long time, Rebecca had actually trusted John White, her stepfather, to take care of Conway, to watch him and to drop him off at his father's home on Wednesdays. There was no reason to suspect John White of anything, or so everyone thought. According to John White, everything that morning went exactly according to plan. He told the investigators that he went to Rebecca's trailer at 6.30am to watch Conway before the drop-off. So the door was unlocked and he walked in. He claimed Rebecca was in the bathroom getting ready for work and she told him, you know, just relax on the couch, relax on the sofa until Conway wakes up. He says he then fell asleep and didn't see Rebecca leave. And as usual, he dropped Conway off with his father around 8 a.m. During this questioning or interrogation, detectives saw a cut on White's nose. And he said that a shelf had fallen on had fallen in his trailer and he showed investigators, you know, the shelf that, that, that fell. And detectives didn't think anything was strange about this. They thought, okay, this story seems legitimate enough. He doesn't appear to be nervous. So at the time, John White wasn't a person of interest. Although they were questioning everyone in Rebecca's life because, you know, you have to cover all your bases. But as part of, you know, the routine investigation, detectives looked into the minister's background. And while some witnesses said that he was a good preacher, others said that he was strange. Investigators then asked John White to take a polygraph. And he didn't want to. Initially, he didn't want to. But his fiancée, Sally Gay, who is Rebecca's mother, she begged him. She pleaded with him, if you have nothing to hide, you will do this. Please they need to clear you so that we can be one step closer to finding out what happened to our Rebecca. So John White, he reluctantly agrees to take the lie detector test. And he failed. But he explained that he was reluctant to do the polygraph test because he had a criminal past that included an attempted murder case. And this was according to Detective Sergeant David Patterson from the Isabella County Sheriff's Office. He is quoted as saying, He told me that he did two years from that, but the case was thrown out. This was according to Detective Sergeant Patterson. He got released. And when he got released, the church elders, feeling so forgiving, feeling that, you know, anyone deserves a second chance. People deserve second chances. He's redeemable. They gave him a second chance. They welcomed him back into the church. All was well, according to everyone. The investigation, however, took a dramatic turn by the evening of Halloween. A trooper found blood and a broken necklace in the back of John White's truck. Detectives obtained a warrant to to search John's home and the vehicle where they found a bag with a rubber mallet, zip ties, construction garbage bags and women's underwear. Around the same time, they also found out that John White had flunked his polygraph test. So all of the items that they found was so chilling. The rubber mallet, the zip ties, women's underwear, the blood. It was just horrific for the people who found it because they thought the absolute worst had happened to Rebecca Gay. Honestly, it shook everyone. It, it's so chilling. Even right now, I've got chills down my spine to think that Rebecca's stepfather 
who was involved in her disappearance. My apologies for the background noise. It appears that we are partying <laughs> right now. So Detective Sergeant Patterson said that it was obvious that he was being deceitful. John White, that is. And around 3 a.m. on the 1st of November, investigators showed John White pictures of his bloodstained truck and the busted necklace. But John claimed that he knew nothing of it. All of this was a surprise to him. But detectives dug deeper into John's past and learned more about the crime he was convicted of. In Battle Creek in 1980, when John White was 22 years old, he lured his neighbor, a 17-year-old lady named Teresa Etherton, into his basement. He repeatedly stabbed her, intending on killing her. But she had survived. Teresa Etherton survived and John White only served two years before getting out on appeal. He said his lawyer should have mounted an insanity defense according to Homicide for the Holidays. Then, in 1994, John White was implicated in the disappearance of a young woman, Vicky Sue Wall. Her body was eventually found. Due to the lack of evidence, John White agreed to plead no contest to involuntary manslaughter. He was behind bars from 1995 to 2007, so for 12 years. In the early morning hours of the 1st of November, John White was ready to talk. He said he would exchange information about Rebecca for a life sentence and being segregated from other prisoners. He then told investigators that the night before Halloween, he drank several beers and watched pornographic websites where people committed sexual acts on dead bodies. He said necrophilia intrigued him and he had fantasized about experiencing that with his stepdaughter, Rebecca Gay. This 24-year-old young woman who was already in a relationship, who had this three-year-old boy, who had no romantic or sexual interest in her mother's fiancé. And this man, oh my gosh, he had these fantasies about her, but not when she was alive. She had to first be dead. Oh my gosh. So after drinking five beers... It sounded like he got enough courage to go to Rebecca's residence, said Detective Sergeant Patterson. She had an unlocked door, so he let himself in. While three-year-old Conway slept, John White, Rebecca's stepfather and little Conway's grandfather figure, beat Rebecca over and over with the rubber mallet. He then slipped a cable tie around her throat and cinched it tight, dragging her body into the kitchen and removing her clothes. He stuffed her in a garbage bag, dumped her down a ravine and drove home. He then moved Rebecca's car to the bar parking lot to mislead detectives. Rebecca's body was ultimately recovered and it appeared that she had ligature marks around her neck. Autopsy results showed signs of abrasions that indicated a sexual assault on Rebecca while she was still alive or shortly after her death, said Detective Sergeant Patterson. I can't even fathom the shock Rebecca felt, the fear Rebecca felt, the confusion. I can't even imagine it. Someone you had grown to trust over the past few years. Someone you probably grew grew to care about and love. Someone you saw as your mother's fiancé, a father figure, a grandfather figure to your three-year-old child. Just violates your privacy, just steps into your home and then attacks you with a rubber mallet, with cable ties. And then violates your body right before or shortly after you pass away. 
all while three-year-old Conway is asleep in his bed. It's so horrific. And this was done by a minister who had previously attacked two other women. Two other women. One woman, he stabbed repeatedly after luring her into the basement of his home. And he only served two years for that crime. Another woman died. She was killed at his hands. Her body was never recovered. But he he pled guilty to involuntary manslaughter and served 12 years for this crime. And he, he just continued on with his life. He rejoined his church. He became a deacon at his church, a minister at his church. People loved him. People respected him. By all accounts, it seemed like he had changed his life. He had turned his life around. But he'd shown so much violence towards women, to young women. He had all of these dark, twisted fantasies. It's, it's so heartbreaking that so many women became victim to one man. To one man. In March 2013, John White pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. He was sentenced to 56 years in prison. And the judge who sentenced him actually said that they didn't want him to ever walk free because of the crimes he had committed in the past. It just showed that this was just a pattern of his. This was just something that he enjoyed doing. And there was no way that he would be able to walk free again. There was no way that he should be allowed to ever walk free again. His fiance Sally Gay, well, his former fiance at the time, when she took the stand and she gave a testimony, she begged the jury not to show him any mercy. She told him, he showed no mercy for my daughter Rebecca, so please don't show him any. For a mother to be on the stand giving her testimony, Speaking about how she lost her daughter, how she lost her world, essentially. How her grandson now had to live without his mother. And this is all because of her own fiancé. A man that she had trusted, a man that she was going to potentially spend the rest of her life with, now broke up her family like this. It was so heartbreaking. And thank goodness the jury... The judge showed no mercy to John White. But the coward he is could not take accountability for his actions, could not face spending the rest of his life in prison. He took his own life in his jail cell just four months after being sentenced. Honestly, I... The justice system gets it wrong so many times. The first attempted murder, him only serving two years, was a miscarriage of justice. And then the other case, where he only served 12 years in jail. And he was, was he even monitored after being released from prison? And okay, why would they monitor him? Because it showed, you know, that he was... He had changed, he was a different man, he was participating in his community, he was an active member of society, he was a monastery at his church, people grew to love and respect him. So perhaps that's why, you know, law enforcement, they weren't watching him with eagle eyes or anything like that, but just see what ended up happening. It's truly shocking. It's truly shocking that he was just indulging in pornographic material and had a few beers and said, this is something I want to do to my stepdaughter. This is something I want to do to Rebecca. 
I could never understand why. John White. He led a tiny church uh, called the Christ Community Fellowship Church in Deerfield Township, which is about 60 miles north of Detroit. He asked his roughly 14 member congregation to pray for Rebecca, you know, while she was suspected to be missing or that foul play had happened to her. He asked his congregation to pray for her. And for 20 excruciating hours, they prayed for Rebecca, according to Sally Gay, Rebecca's mother. This is what she told the court during the trial. And she said to her former fiancé, she was not yours to take. How dare you? She also asked the court to show him the same lack of mercy which he showed her daughter, Rebecca. She said that her family was devastated by Rebecca's death, whom she called the family's heart and soul. And she said that little Conway was going to suffer more than anyone. And as I mentioned before, the church members knew of his past. They believed that anyone could be redeemed. How cruel... I ask this question so often. How cr cruel do you have to be to just act innocent after the horrific crimes you've committed? To go to your congregation, to look at your fiancé, the mother of your victim in the eyes and say, let's pray for Rebecca. Our God will bring her home. And for 20 excruciating hours, everyone looked at their church leader and they prayed for Rebecca. All along, this man knew what he had done. This is not okay. Of course it's not okay. I mean, that goes without saying. His criminal past, that alone, shows you that he really did not care for women. But to ask your congregation to pray for your victim, knowing what you've done, it's just a different level. It's a different level. So... Isabella County Chief Circuit Judge Paul Chamberlain ordered John White to serve from 56 to 85 years behind bars in the killing of Rebecca Gay, saying he saw no reason why John White, who had two prior convictions for attacking women, should ever leave prison. White pleaded guilty to second-degree murder as a habitual third offender in Gay's slaying, and the police... They knew that, you know, he had confessed, so he was going to jail. But this man, John White, could not face what he did. He could not take accountability for what he did. Although he pleaded guilty, he could not see himself being in jail for 56 to 85 years. So, four months after he was sentenced, he took his own life, which is infuriating. It's infuriating that he ended it all so fast in his cell. It feels like all his victims have been robbed of any justice, especially Rebecca Gay's family and Rebecca Gay herself. It, it, it honestly bothers me so much because on one hand you could argue, okay, well, at least we don't have to breathe the same air as this man anymore. But on another hand, if you're going to do the crime, do the time. Honestly, it seems like such a corny thing to say. But to just absolve yourself of any responsibility and to just be done with it. To be like, you know what? Yeah, I, I did that, but I'm, I'm not going to go to jail. But he didn't want to face any serious repercussions for the first attempted murder. He only saw two years in jail. Then the second murder, the manslaughter he pleaded guilty to, 12 years in jail. And then now his stepdaughter, 
four months, then he takes his life. I, d- I don't understand it. But this is the case of Rebecca Gay, who was a beautiful woman, so loved by her family, loved by her boyfriend, loved by her son Conway, co-parenting with Conway's father. She had a job that she loved, a job that she was good at. People cared about her so much that when they noticed that she didn't show up at work, they went looking for her. May Rebecca soul rest in peace. Conway is old enough to be on the internet now. So if you are watching, always be kind. Always show empathy. I'm so sorry that this happened. I'm so sorry that these things happen and continue to happen. This has been another video for my channel. Thank you for watching. And I hope to see you in the next one. Please take care of yourself. Take care of your family and your friends. And do your best to stay safe. Bye.